Yeah, so like Lance said, I know this event is called special events, um, but I'm gonna mess that up a little bit because what I did is not at all a traditional in-person on-site event. I instead put it online so that everyone could do it. So before we get into that, I'll do a little introduction. I'm Lainey Cannon. Um, I work for Citrix, which is a software company, technology company, um, provides cloud computing services, virtual apps and desktops, file sharing, among many other products. I actually currently, my role is in the product compliance and certifications team. Um, but more importantly to this audience is my background is communications, marketing, and anthropology. So when I came into Citrix a couple of years ago, I had actually spent a lot of my time doing marketing communications and event planning, and so I came in as a communications specialist under the security organization. So why that's important for this conversation is because some of the challenges I face is over time I took over security awareness, but when I first walked in, I was just doing comms. It's a little bit different. Outside of my normal day job, I spend a lot of time on our women's board at Citrix. I also am heavily involved in the Raleigh local music community, and then I spend a copious amount of time with my foster dogs. Um, so that's my life outside of security. I'm gonna tell you a story um, about being in college. So way back in the day, I had a professor who came into class our first day um, and did what I call now the Dead Poet Society moment. If you've ever seen the movie, you're tracking with what that is. He told us to stand on our desk. And we had just moved into a brand new $100 million business school, so the desk he was asking us to stand on probably cost more than my tuition. Um, but he was a really scary looking guy, so we all did it. Um, and he made us hop up and down and do this whole Simon Says of jumping on one foot and patting our head and rubbing our stomach. And at the end of all of it, he did the Dead Poet Society thing where he says, in my classroom, I need you to do this. I need you to come in here every day and think differently than you've been taught to think, and do things differently than you've always done them. And the reason I tell you this story now is because after I left college, I didn't really think about this until I got back into security awareness. And that's because we all know that you have to have adaptable, flexible training, and you have to think outside the box or do a little bit of standing on your table thinking to really get to a conclusion and engaging training that works for all of your employees. So that's how I think about it, and that'll make a little bit more sense as we go through this. So, Along with that, unlike advertising, security awareness training and our jobs really haven't been around for all that long. So my anthropology hat says, as long as people have been buying and selling things, they've also been advertising. My clay pots are better than his clay pots and here's why. So you add that to an already difficult landscape of trying to engage your employees because all companies are different and all their risks are different and all your company culture is different. So that is very similar to advertising, where you have to tailor your content and your training to your employees. Also, there's some simple math here. We don't have this solution when it comes to security awareness training. And what I mean by that is there's hardly anyone that's gonna argue that two plus two equals four, but because we all know that cyber criminals are changing how they're attacking our systems and our employees every week, every month, every year, we have to have training that's flexible and adaptable to that. And so then I spent a lot of my time standing on my desk and thinking about how we approach that. So I don't really think I have to explain that to you guys because that's really selling peanuts to peanut farmers. I don't think you would be in your jobs or really at this conference if you didn't already know that engaging and innovative and flexible, adaptable training was important. So instead I'm gonna talk about some challenges that I faced and I think that other people may have faced them as well. So the first is money or lack thereof. So who in the room by show of hands feels like you have maybe not a great size budget. And we're gonna couple that with my other challenge, which was remote employees or a global workforce. So offices, not just in one location. Anyone else have that challenge? Awesome. So I did too, and that again goes back to because I came in as a communications person. If you're not a communications person, I'm gonna give a little background here. When you're sending out emails or blog posts, your annual budget is like zero dollars. Like literally cost no money. And then you take on security awareness and training, with the communications budget of zero dollars. Um, and you couple that with Citrix has about 8,000 employees over 20 plus countries, different time zones, and that's not including our partially or fully remote employees. So those are my two big challenges and that's where I ended up with the digital scavenger hunt. So keep an eye on this logo because you'll see it a little bit later, but my two challenges that I faced were budget or lack thereof and then having a really global workforce Kind of told you my challenges, but didn't really explain exactly what a digital scavenger hunt is. So it's the traditional scavenger hunt model that I'm sure most of you are familiar with, where clues and riddles and question and answers lead to either more clues, question and answers, and riddles, 
or it leads to prizes. We made it digital so that everyone could be included in the training, and then instead of like kids at a birthday party, you're training your employees. All of that together gave global and engaging awareness training for us, um, but I'll tell you how I got there, and that's because I wanted to do some, glo some a, do a digital scavenger hunt in our Raleigh office. Because that's where I sit, and so that made the most sense to me. I was there. But I was only going to be training 600 or 700 people. And then I was like, okay, so I have to either make this mobile and then go with it to all these other offices, which requires time and money I don't really have, or I'm going to have to mobilize the scavenger hunt, hope there's an ambassador there, or hope there's another security team member there that has the time in their schedule to do it for me. Um, and even if I did one or both of those things, it's not really including all of our remote employees who are already feeling kind of left out of training, at least the interesting training and not just the compliance checkbox training. All right, here's the big ticker, right? We all know we have a budget issue for the most part. So I'm here to tell you you can set it up and incentivize the entire digital scavenger hunt for the total cost of about zero bucks if you choose to do it that way. So remember Morgan Freeman, we'll come back to him a little bit later, but what's more important for me in that time and as well as now is those remote employees or those globally dispersed employees. And it's pretty easy for me as a person in a technology company to say remote workers are important or you should include them in training. My company also makes software that enables people to work anywhere. So like, yeah, duh, I have employees that are remote, right? Um, but if you're not facing this issue, I do want to just bring your attention to something to keep in mind as you're building training, because even if you're in a situation where that maybe doesn't affect you yet, or you don't have more than one office location, it might be coming. So this is a study put out by Owl Labs in 2018. It's called the Global State of Remote Work. And I, you don't have to read all the numbers, but just kind of give a picture of what remote work looks like right, right now. So you got about 18% of folks work entirely remote. They never set foot into a Citric office or any office, right? And this is across all inhabited continents and all industries. So it's not just technology, it's manufacturing and finance and healthcare. Um, so two things I want you to take away from this is one, if you're currently in a situation where you aren't facing this, you can still totally do a digital scavenger hunt. If all your folks are in one office, A-OK, -okay, it'll still work. But second to that is just keep in mind when you are building security awareness training that it may become important for you later. And we all know that there's a move towards this idea of more work-life balance, which includes longer parental leave, but you want to keep those employees productive. Um, so that leads to remote work. And then we also have knowledge and skill gap. So right now, if you have an open position you can't feel, fill in your company because you can't find anyone in your town or your state to do it, or maybe even your country, so today you might not have a remote work or worker, or you might not have a second office location, but maybe it's coming down the line. So it's always a good thing to keep in the back of your mind. Hopefully at this point I've convinced you I also face the same two challenges a lot of you had, but haven't convinced you of at least one of those challenges that the digital scavenger hunt solved. The rest of this is going to get really, really boring for you, and I'm sorry. Um, if you not often go to sleep, no harm, no foul. So what I'm going to walk you through now is the setup and groundwork on the back end. So this is what we did to set up the scavenger hunt. I'm then going to walk you through the more important part, which was the employee experience. So if you were an employee at Citrix, you would know how you went through the scavenger hunt. And then after all of that, I'm going to give you some takeaways that hopefully will enable you to implement a similar kind of scavenger hunt. So first and foremost, we set it up during the month of October. So we ran it, as many of you guys have talked about, during National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. We ran it in conjunction with articles and webinars and digital signage in our buildings, um, so entire month long. And we set it up in the back end on this thing called Podio, which is a lightweight project management software. It's actually a product of Citrix. Um, so we used this because it's what we had. And this is where I collected all the question and answers and names and email addresses associated with those. You don't have to do that. You can use whatever you already have. You can use something like Google Forms. Whatever is already in your arsenal of tools that you're using, use that. Don't go out and buy anything new. Use what, you're, what you already have. And then because I have a comms background, I have to talk about this a little bit. Um, so we did some comms leading up to the digital scavenger hunt, which included newsletters and um, intranet content to let users know what was coming, what it was, how to participate, and then what they would get for participating. Uh, we also ran this during the month of October, kind of just highlight it and remind people that it's still going on and here's how you participate. 
So this is a sticking point for a lot of people, and I've heard this kind of across this week and at all the different tables I've sat at, which is working cross-functionally with teams who aren't in security. And maybe those people create bottlenecks for you, or they don't totally get security awareness training, but for my purposes, I found it really beneficial to work with those people and forge relationships with them. So the teams I worked with were internal comms, so they own all of our intranet content. And when we go through what it looked like and how we set it up, um, as far as the employee experience, a lot of it was built in our intranet. So they own that, and they could also help with like changing those questions and rewording any of our clues to make sure our global audience could understand them. Because that's kind of their job. As internal communications for a global company, they already know how to tailor some of that content, and it made my job a lot easier. Second to that, I worked with our web team. So they own the back end of our intranet, and they would go in and drop that icon I mentioned earlier. You'll see it again later. Um, and so they did that for me, and then I worked with our security team. And so not just the team that I vertically reported into, but I worked across the security team for two reasons. One, make sure we weren't gonna ask any questions that for some reason would make us in a bad situation or tell people something we didn't want to tell employees, um, put us at risk for anything, which if you're doing a high level basic scavenger hunt, you're not really gonna run into that. And then the second thing was to see what they wanted to train users on. What were they seeing in their jobs that they thought was important to include in the scavenger hunt? This is what it would look like if you were a Citrix employee in the month of October and you are gonna go through the scavenger hunt. We drop clues in Slack. So if you're unfamiliar with Slack, it is a um, IM collaboration platform. You can talk in group messages, channels, or DMs. You can also do Slack calls and a ton of things. We already have a lot of people participating in Slack, um, especially in the Raleigh office. We have what's called a free food channel. So if you have a meeting and you have a bunch of leftover donuts, it is like a flock of seagulls running to your office to get those donuts. So we already knew our users were there, but more importantly than that, when you start at Citrix, you kind of get put into our general channel. So we had all of our users already baked in. And I think this is really, really important because you don't want your users to have to go anywhere new. You don't wanna to have to procure a new software, a new tool. If they're already engaging in one spot, make your life easier, don't recreate the wheel, and just go there. So your clue would look something like this, and it was my face attached to all of them, which in the end resulted in people knowing at least who I was, so I could get a little bit of a friendly face put with security, and people who maybe didn't know our security team now at least knew me, which was in some ways good, and then in some ways I had to forward a lot of emails to other teams. Um, but for this example, just kind of pay attention to report a potential issue, because we're going to follow that through the whole scavenger hunt. So this is our internet site. It's called Backstage. Um, it, this I pulled off like about a week ago, so it's kind of changed title as far as what the icon was. But if you found that clue in Slack and it led you to the place here, you would find that same button, which is report a technology or security issue. And right under that button, you would find this icon, maybe. And that icon you've already seen in all the communications leading up to it. And then additionally to that, it's not something you would always see in our internet site, so it would kind of stick out like a sore thumb. You would know that that was something that was part of the scavenger hunt. So you knew you were in the right spot, you knew you had followed the clue correctly, and then this would pop up on the end for you. So this would open as a separate tab. Again, this is Podio, but the front end of it. So this is what it looked like for our users. It was just the question and then their email address and name. And the purpose of collecting their email address and name is obviously so when I'm assigning winners or points, you know what it looks like and who they go to. So it would really contradict um, a lot of what I said earlier about having flexible, adaptable training and making sure it fits your employees and your culture. If I stood up here and said this is exactly how we do it and it's very prescriptive and you have to go home and do exactly what I said and this is how the only way that it works for everybody. So instead, I'm gonna show you the kind of shoe that fit our group and how it worked, and then I'm gonna take you to the shoe store and let you pick out whatever shoes you think will work for your group. So, first step in this is you're gonna decide where you wanna engage your audience. Number one, where are you gonna post your clues? And then number two, where do you wanna lead those people? It can be one place, it can be 10 places. Again, for our example, we used two. So Slack is where we dropped the clues, and we wanted to lead them to our intranet site backstage. Again, you don't have to do that. Maybe you use Microsoft Teams, Google Hangouts. If your own company runs entirely on email and you guys are really active in that, do that. Don't drag employees anywhere new. Meet them where they already are because you'll have a baked in audience and it takes a lot of the work off of you of trying to both get the audience to go somewhere and then engage. All you're having to do at this point is just the engagement piece part. 
And I promise that I'm not just saying that because I have this cool Podio site that's done a lot of this for me. I did this at a previous company as well. It had nothing to do with security. It was all about employee engagement. Um, and we did it through email and SharePoint and the really, really, really free basic version of SharePoint. So you, it can be done in other locations. You don't have to have a project management software and you don't have to have Slack. Use whatever tools you already have. Second step to this is decide what you want your audience to know or find. So this will depend where you are in the security awareness model and how mature you are. So say you're not super mature, you just started out, maybe you want people to go to a location. And what I mean by that is do they know where your security policies are? Are there a list of IT and security contacts in your intranet that you want people to know about? Do they know how to report phishing? Is there a spot on your intranet or whatever site you use that tells them about phishing? And you want them to just at least know where the resources are. And then on the other end of that is maybe you're a little more mature and they know where your policies are and they know how to contact your security team, but you want to actually increase their security IQ. You want them to know more knowledge-based questions. Maybe you send them to a webinar that you've already put out and you want them to watch that and then regurgitate or tell you what they learned. Maybe it's a knowledge-based article you've already put out about password complexity and you want them to give you an example of a really complex password. It can be either or it can be both and that's what we did. And the reason we did both, this is totally on me, is because again, when I took over a piece part of security awareness training, I didn't really know where we were as far as maturity. I didn't know what our employees knew or what they didn't know. Um, so I kind of did a combination. I sent people to knowledge-based articles, I sent folks to webinars, but I also sent them to places like, here's where our policies are housed. Um, so hit them in both directions. And so this is the most important part to me, um, and it's because, actually let me ask you a question first. How many people in the room have ever met another human being? At any point, at any time? <laughs> Show of hands, come on. Okay, so like 100%, awesome. Um, the reason I ask you that is because I'm gonna let you in on a little secret, and I don't know if you know this about people already, you probably do. We are really, really, really selfish beings. And we want things for ourselves, and we want personal benefit and gain. So you kinda do have to give people that a little bit. So there's a competition aspect, and that'll drive a lot of employees, because we also are competition-driven beings. Um, but you're gonna wanna incentivize them to do it because I don't know about anyone else, but I really don't wanna do any training over and above what's mandatory unless there's something in it for me, right? That's just kinda of how it is. Um, so what you're gonna do is decide what winning looks like to you. So is that most participation? Is that the highest score so they got every single question correct? Is it put people in teams? Maybe it's the finance team versus sales or marketing versus engineering and have a group score. And I'll tell you lesson learned here is we were gonna do it like a traditional scavenger hunt where it's actually the first person to the correct answer. And then we realized that that would really not be fun for the people that were sleeping in Bangalore, India when I was posting clues and everyone on the East Coast was winning. Um, so that's what we went with. Every week of October, we had a winner that was based on participation. And then the entire month, we had a winner that was based on total correct answers. And you might get down to the end of the month and you have a handful of people that have the most correct answers. We used a random name generator at that point, which we had explained fully in all the communications leading up to it that that may be what it came down to. And then the really, really important part, what are you gonna give them, right? Maybe it's an iPad, maybe it's an Apple Watch. Oh, Lainey, you told us it was gonna be free. And now you're talking about prizes, which sound like they cost money, which sounds like budget I don't have. And I promise, 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 I didn't lie. You can do it. So here's what we did. We gave people credit to our Citrix shop. Um, it's basically a promotional online store. Uh, all of our Citrix swag, like t-shirts, water bottles, notepads, all of that. So yeah, it did cost us some money, but if you're giving away, say, $100 in promotional gift cards, it doesn't actually equal 100 bucks because you ordered all of that in the past, in bulk, because it's promotional items but you still can do it for free. And here's an example. Maybe you give a reserved parking spot. I come to work like not at seven o'clock in the morning, more like nine o'clock every day. Um, so if I could park on the first floor of our garage versus the seventh floor, I would be really, really happy. 
okay, Lainey, but our other option was to include remote workers, and now you're going to give them a parking spot that they're never going to be able to use. That sounds really awesome. Thank you for the tips. Um, maybe you give them a choice. You work with executive leadership or management, and you give an extra PTO day or a half a PTO day. Maybe you have a culture that's really around volunteering and corporate giving, and you work with them to give an extra volunteer day every year, or you have them pick where your corporate giving goes. You have them choose their nonprofit. They want some or all of your corporate giving to go that year. Maybe it's a lunch with the CEO or a lunch with your chief security officer. You have to do a little bit of standing on your table thinking, and I don't actually recommend to do it physically because I'm not sure how Hilton's liability insurance is. Um, but do it mentally at least. Think about how this could be flexible and adaptable to you that won't actually cost you any money. I don't know if anyone else has this issue, but as in most things in life, if I knew then what I know now, I would make a lot of different choices. Um, so the first one being design thinking. And I'm in, by no means an expert in design thinking, but it's a model and a process for designing for problems and problem solving that put people at the center of it. And here's a basic outline of what it looks like and all the arrows that go back to the beginning. It's because at any stage in this process, you can kick it off and go back. And that's really important when you're designing something like security awareness training, and here's why. I think that in our lives and in our careers, and at least me in this role, I solve problems that I think exist. Surface level doesn't sound bad, right? Problem solving, there's, have you ever applied to a job that did not say, we really prefer you not to be a problem solver? Probably not, right? It's a good idea. But if you solve problems you think exist versus solve them problems that do exist, you're going to create more work for yourself on the back end. And you're going to eventually have to still solve those problems that do exist. And what I mean by that is this process and this model of design thinking allows you to work with your end users, in this case your employees, and figure out what they know and what they don't know. And maybe you know, the industry trend is about phishing. And so you're training people on what a phishing email looks like, what a phishing email looks like, what a phishing email looks like. But they know. And if you sat down with them, they'd say, yeah, this is a phishing email. I know what this looks like. But I don't know how to report it. I don't know, do we have an email address? Do we have a button? I haven't really been told that part. And maybe it's flip-flopped. They know exactly where to send it, but they don't really know what it looks like, so you're getting a whole bunch of spam. So instead of thinking about what maybe the industry trend is, take that, but then apply it to your end users. Sit with them, interview maybe job shadow them, stand at your front door and see if piggybacking really is a problem for you guys. Because then you're at least starting with what the human actual risk is versus what you think it is. So this is especially important for doing a digital scavenger hunt, in my opinion, is because you can tailor every single question. Nothing has to be out of the box. If you know that your risk is something to do with badging in, you can change all of your questions to be about badging in. So, up to you how you use this, but I think it was really important, and I would have spent a lot of time in those first two steps of empathize and define. This leads me to being data-driven. I put it in quotation marks because I think it's a buzzword, and I think we maybe overuse it a little bit, but I also think it's super, super important, and it's something we should use. So again, I kind of took this on ad hoc originally, so I didn't do a ton of background data work or trending over time, which I should have. Um, and since have done to see what behavior changes we actually impl like implemented based on our questions or how our employees were retaining information over time. But at the time, I wasn't doing that. So again, I'm not the expert in metrics and dashboards. But for this particular activity or event, it is somewhere you can track behavior changes. So for example, if I were to do this again, I actually might run it for a really long time, maybe a year, and just create a leaderboard. And every quarter we could give a prize, or every month, but have a leaderboard to show over time who's winning, whatnot. But I would test the same question at the beginning and then test it again at the end. Now you would have a delta of people who just remembered it because they memorized things for fun, but then you'd have the other people who you could actually prove to learn something, especially if you write that question in a way where people have to go and apply knowledge. It's not just where are our policies housed, but instead you're asking them to do something so you can prove that not only did they watch your compliance annual training video, but now they've retained some information too and maybe could put it into action later. A couple of takeaways again. Find where your employees are gauging. 
please, 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 please don't make your job any harder. We already have really hard jobs. Go where they already are. Don't go out and procure a new software. If you have something that works for your employees right now, I just ask that you just use that, right? Second, there must be incentive. Selfish, 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 selfish people we are. We only want things that benefit us, so make sure there's something in it for them, but it doesn't always have to cost money. Prove your results through data. Again, just don't be like me. Trend your data before you run your scavenger hunt, and then do it during, and then after, because then you can have some behavior changes you can measure. Design thinking. So actually, I want a little bit of audience participation. We're gonna say it together. So I'll say it, and you can repeat after me. Don't solve problems you think exist. Solve them that do. So all of that together, you can have expensive, if not free, training that's global and can scale across all of your employees, even if they're remote and never, ever set foot into an office. So if you're not like this dog and your program doesn't get any budget, and Oprah is giving remote working days to everybody and that's being a real pain for you, you can still create global content for your employees that will train them and engage them. I am Lainey Cannon. I would love to meet you in real life. I clearly like to talk and be awkward, so feel free to talk to me in real life.